this is both slightly sad to be doing it like this but also it never it's always still exciting and it's I don't know it's about waking up and it's sunny and it's like first women's prize video you know yeah yeah um it's put me in a good mood here Anna and I are in a uh, zoom form this time unfortunately we can't be in uh, physically together uh, but yeah we still want to give our women's prize long list predictions for this year which we are so excited about giving and I know a lot of other people are really excited too because we've been getting a lot of messages from uh, people with their predictions it's been really great seeing everyone's guesses and really like encouraging to see that people are excited to see our discussion and I think like a lot of people are just excited to have you know Know, like a book prize to get excited okay. about and a list to talk about to you know as sort of distraction from other like bigger events in in the world um so uh so yeah this is um really great to see and uh just to, i i never know how much to sort of say in uh as by way of introduction for people who might not have seen us before as so i know a lot of people um have been watching us do this for years and years uh, but uh, but other people might be new to my channel and might not have seen us do these videos before but uh but basically every year, uh, my wonderful friend Anna James and I, um, Anna James here, um, who's a great writer and journalist, does a long list predictions video where we each pick 16 books that we think might be on this year's Women's Prize for Fiction. And uh, we alternate between our lists going through alphabetically. We don't know what each other has chosen, so it's lovely uh, surprise for both of us. I'm really excited to see what Anna has chosen. Um, there might be some overlap or there might be some titles that um, the other one hasn't heard of before. I should say um, the uh, the actual long list will be announced on March 10th. So yeah, it's very soon uh, away, but, um, but we can look forward to seeing how much our predictions list match up with the actual list. And the short list will be announced on April 28th, and the winner will be announced on July 7th, which is actually really exciting because if everything goes according to plan with the UK roadmap for getting out of lockdown, uh, we might be able to have an actual physical party to celebrate the women's prize for fiction too much the thought of it's almost too much i know that i'm gonna get fixated on the women's prize party as the thing to look mm -hmm. forward to that i really desperately want to happen are you already planning your outfit <laughs> oh you know i am yeah. <laughs> but also of course uh please let us know in the comments below uh your own predictions or books that you're really rooting for hoping to see on the list this year because like i said it's so wonderful seeing everyone's like guesses and predictions and um because yeah it's just a lovely excuse to chat about books and um some some great novels that have been published in the past year so shall we just yeah because um, this is I feel like this has got the potential to be a really good year I feel like there was a lot of books that I've either read and really genuinely mm -hmm. loved or books I'm really excited to read and it wasn't kind of scrabbling to try and find ones that I thought oh maybe the judges will go for which I feel like it's always unpredictable and there always will be those wild cards on the long list that I you don't even consider as be. an option or books you've never heard of um mm -hmm. but I am um, optimistic I had I reckon I had about 25 I found it quite easy to get down to 25 mm -hmm. books and then it was hard going getting that down to 16 and I absolutely like some that it's mainly a prediction although there's definitely some wishful thinking in my picks uh if I had to pick between two, sometimes I've gone for the one I liked better rather than the one I actually think has got the best chance. I usually just go for books that I've only read, but um, but I have thrown in a few that I haven't read and that I'm really anticipating. Oh, I'm excited! <laughs> <laughs> I am too. Would you uh, like to start? Let's, I went, well, I do wonder if, well, it depends because you never know. You might have slipped something in before this, but I, 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 I wonder if we've both got this one. My first choice. Mm is The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett. Yes. Yay! <laughs> I, did, I think this is going to be a very common choice in predictions. Um, it's been one of the, I mean, Britt Bennett, was she, she was on the cover of Time magazine, was it? Like the other week, it's like one of the most influential Americans. Which yeah, just incredible. So exciting seeing an author reach that kind of level of recognition, especially one who is relatively early in her career. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the Vanishing Half has just been ever. I'd be extremely surprised if anyone has made it to this video on your channel without having heard of it at all. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like it's one of the books that almost everyone uh, has read. Have you read it? 
I have. And yeah, and I absolutely loved it. I, I think it's an incredible book. And, and I think it's one of those books that I think on the, the surface, um, some people can be a bit dismissive about because it's like, oh, it's about identity issues. But the way she handles it is so uh, complex and uh, really moving. I thought it was so wonderful how it handles like looking not only at race, but also gender and class and yeah. So it's so, so good. She's just such a marvellous writer. Like, it's so good. She's so good. Um, I'd be very surprised if this wasn't long listed. Me too, yeah. Um, so shall I go on to my next one? Um, <laughs> I have to explain, like, my my <laughs> note cards um, that I I, um, I usually rely on Anna for stationery too, because <laughs> she has so much pretty stationery. And so I was, I was like, oh, I have to get some pretty stationery for myself. So I ordered these cards for myself. And I thought they were just note cards, but they're actually actual cards so I can do like a reveal or a reveal. <laughs> so my next choice after Britt Bennett uh, is Plain Bad Heroines by Emily M. Danforth. I don't, I didn't, I didn't pick this one, although you can actually see it it's just sitting there oh, yeah. ready for, yeah. I haven't read it yet, but it's up that I, it's one I'm really looking forward to reading and, and I think we'll probably read next month. Um, I've heard mixed things about it. Oh, okay. I just read it quite recently and um and I just love the the whole experience of it. So it's a it's a sort of dual story of um about a New England school for girls in the early 1900s, which has a sort of curse around it. Um a number of girls at the school are found dead and the school is closed shortly after that. And then almost a hundred years later, a film is being made about this supposed curse around the, the school and sort of creepy things are happening, but also sort of about the machinations of Hollywood and celebrity and, and identity. And, and, um, and so it's sort of a, a, a really enjoyable Gothic story um, that's uh, plot driven and, and there's lots of exciting twists and turns in it. Um, but I also think it's like really thoughtful um, and, and very playful and just, it's just so much fun to read. I had so much fun to reading it. And after I finished reading it, I thought like, this is a novel that Anna has to read because um, I just feel like you'll really <laughs> enjoy it too. And, and I know you love novels set around like schools for girls and and um yeah so I just I yeah I, I think it's really great and I I hope more people read it and talk about it because I think it'll just be such a pleasure for people to read and enjoy I'm really looking forward to reading it when I got the proof like I did think like on paper this is extremely my sort of book um and I it is quite long it, it so yeah, I know that's probably, always a slight like, concern like, it's a big chunky it's a big chunky one. like 500 or 600 pages long yeah so but it's yeah. one of those books like once you get into the story if you're enjoying the story that yeah. you just don't really notice the page numbers so much because you're enjoying it I would be delighted if that was long listed um it's one I'm very much looking forward to so my next choice is The Manning Tree Witches by A.K. Blakemore oh um, I feel like I'm letting you down after all that about my stationery. I couldn't find any appropriately sized pretty stationery and I'm just on index cards, Fine. but there we go. <laughs> um, this is not one I've read yet, but one I am so looking forward to reading. And um, that's the cover there. It's um, mm. also one that I've heard there's people on Twitter who I trust their taste talking about how much that they've loved it. Um, and so, I'm excited. I, I thought I was done with witch books. I feel like we've had quite a <laughs> glut of witch books in the UK, many of which I've really enjoyed, but it does mean that I've, and I feel like I keep, I'm still getting proofs and books of witch books. And I, I <laughs> thought I'd kind of reached capacity with that, but this just sounds wonderful. And it's published, A.K. Blakemore is a poet, I believe. This is their debut novel. It just sounds like weird and like a new take on it. It's described as being like Fleabag meets Hilary Mantel, but also it's 1643 uh, witches. And that just- Fun. That just sounds great. <laughs> yes, I've not read it yet either, but I um, have an advanced copy of it and I'm, it's one I've been sort of looking forward to. So my next one, uh, is Burnt Sugar by Avni Doshi, which uh, of course was yeah on the Booker Prize shortlist. So it seems very likely candidate, but also is one that I 
just absolutely loved reading. And it actually, even though I really loved Douglas Stewart's novel as well, and uh, when, if I was like pushed to pick my winner and when I did my sort of Booker prediction, I was sort of hoping Burn Sugar would win, as well as thinking it's beautifully crafted, like really the technical craft of how she made this novel and in terms of like showing its themes. Um, so for people who don't know, it's it's about a, a mother-daughter relationship, a adult daughter who is now caring for the mother um, who didn't really care for her when she was growing up or or nurture her in the way that um, in the supportive way that she needed. And um and now her mother is um showing potential signs of dementia. And so she's in this very awkward and terrible position of having to care for the mother that never really cared for her. Yeah, it's it's a very emotional story. And but the way she sort of looks at that and and looks at the issue of memory and the way the the story plays out it's actually surprisingly suspenseful and i i thought in the way that she reveals information about the past and and how you went to question information about the past and and you know subjective memory and and all of that and and um and yeah and i just found it very personally moving um reading it by myself so um have you have you read it I haven't read it yet. Okay. Um, I must admit, I have been anxious about how, like, just, you know, it sounds very intense. I've just never been quite in the, at the moment where I wanted to pick it up. Um, but I um, I basically put it in because it was book a shortlist and because I know you liked it. My next one I know you don't have because it's alphabetically impossible. Um, <laughs> and it's Boy Parts by Eliza Clark, which so okay so I haven't read this because I'm terrified of it I think I've been told it would be too much for me oh okay <laughs> it's quite dark uh and I think it's quite a body stuff in and a friend um she felt like it who really liked it said it was excellent but thought that it I would find it a bit distra <laughs> distressing mm -hmm. um Eliza's I don't know her uh personally but I follow her on Twitter and I think she's so funny and good on Twitter that's why I bought the book even though I haven't read it because I wanted to support her also it's published by a small publisher it's published by Influx yeah and I do think the prize does always like to make sure that a small presses are represented mm. um I did have because right this is a whole conversation maybe for a later video because I had a sort of shortlist basically of what you could kind of call like disaster women books um mm. that kind of millennial a Rooney but well, they're not even Rooney S, they get, all get described, but you know, young women yeah. who are kind of struggling to adult and who drink too much to make terrible decisions. And I feel like there's a real mm. yeah, like chaos women thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I had quite a few, there's quite a few, and I sort of was wondering about which ones I don't think that, um, even though I actually think any of them on their own merits actually might be in contention, I don't think there's gonna have a long list full of four of them. So, um, and also I might be misrepresenting boy parts because I haven't read it, but as far as I understand it, it's about a woman who makes very dark and uh, bad decisions. <laughs> but again, I might be misrepresenting it. Uh, I haven't read it uh, myself, but it's one that's definitely been on my radar and that I've been wanting to, to read. And I know people like Matthew Sharapa really loved it and Jan was trying to encourage me to read it. And like, and yeah, and so this. Um, yeah, I definitely want to get to it at some point, whether it's on the list or not. Uh, right, your pick. <laughs> okay, my next one is Big Girl, Small Town by Michelle Gallen. Oh, I didn't pick this one and I'm only very vaguely aware of it. Um, you might have heard of it because it was on the Cost of Book Awards first novel shortlist. Um, <laughs> you might see a few of those books um, here. That's cause... literally why the, I was literally the only reason I know about it. <laughs> Yeah, and um, which was one of the reasons why I was like so glad that we um, were able to put it on the list because I think it's a really extraordinary novel and just I hadn't heard many people talking about it before um, that. So yeah, I was um, really happy to do that, but also like genuinely was one of my favorite books that I, I read last year. And so it's set in Northern Ireland during the Troubles and that's sort of occurring in the background, but you don't hear, it's not too much of the story. Mostly it's about the um, subjective perspective of this uh, young woman who is autistic. It's never explicitly said, but basically is autistic. And basically the entire novel is her making a list of things that she's not very keen on. And 
um, so it's her sort of criticizing her town and her family and um, and uh, sort of Ireland in general through her her own perspective and and you just get this wonderful sense of this is her making her voice known whereas a lot of the people in the community are sort of dismissing her and not really taking her seriously and um and the way the story handles that and does take her seriously i think is so power powerful and moving um as well as being amusing so so i i sort of pitch it as like milkman but it's it's kind of funnier it's, okay. it's kind of like milkman meets dairy girls that that's um that's how i would describe it i and, love um, both those things so that's making me want to read it yeah i think it's i i, I think it's, it's so good it, it um yeah just really wrapped me up in its story and i think it's so well done yeah and i and i i, I hope that it gets more attention another uh alphabetical impossibility of a match uh and that is luck and boo by jenny fagan oh um which again I haven't read <laughs> I have I, I feel like I'd read more this year but I yeah I think some of them made it like I cut some of the ones I had read at the last minute because I like there were more personal preferences um but this I am so excited to read this is going to be my treat this in the new George Saunders are uh, when I've handed in I have a, a new draft of my book to hand in next week uh. and those are the two books that are my rewards <laughs> about like a like a, a house in Edinburgh that's kind of I, I, like bad things and it's like haunted by different stories and it's told through different generations and it just like extremely my sort of thing kind of historical generations stories about stories and I just that's the cover there like look how good that is like I'm just very excited to read it and I've also heard like it seems to have been very well received as well it just came out earlier this year I think um it did just about a month ago yeah so I have high hopes for it um, and would love to see it long listed, even though I'm ready yet. I just think it sounds brilliant. Oh, no, you're doing a face like you've read it and didn't read it. <laughs> well, that? I know this is like the awkward thing. I don't want to like dampen your enthusiasm. Hey, don't give anything about. away. Don't give anything away. But I can tell by your face what <laughs> you didn't uh, yeah, like I, it. I definitely didn't include it, purposely didn't include it on the list. Because okay. I, I, yeah, I know it's... um. Yeah, there's been a lot of reviews that have been raving about it. And like on the surface, I feel like it's it's sort of strange, isn't it, with some novels that I feel like ideologically, I completely agree with this novel. I think it's great, everything that it's doing. And I really enjoy Jenny Fagan's writing. I, I really liked a, a previous novel I read by her, um, but I just felt this novel was maybe a bit too ambitious or self-conscious about what it was trying to do. It is a lot of different stories and um, she she comes up with a very clever structure in the way um, she gives those stories because you're, you're sort of revolving between the stories and, and I don't wanna, yeah, I won't give anything too much away, but I think I think it's, it's very clever. There's a lot about it that's really enjoyable. Um, I, it just uh, didn't quite totally work. For me. Okay. Oh, well, that's interesting. I'm intrigued now to read that. it. <laughs> and uh, we can, if it does get long listed, we can uh, mm. see how I, well, I'm going to read it anyway. Um, but mm. yeah. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Mm. But yeah, I'll definitely be excited to discuss it with you regardless. Okay. okay. Uh, your turn. My next one is uh, a lot of people have been mentioning uh, <laughs> Transcendent Kingdom by Yasi. Yeah, it's, um, it seems like uh, quite a obvious choice um, and it's um, it hasn't been published yet but I think it publishes like literally the day before the yes. deadline I should have said at the beginning published between April 1st 2020 and March 31st 2021 and um, and so it's it was quite confusing uh, sort of going through the, the list this year because even more than usual um, since publication dates in the past year have been it's changing around a lot, a lot. It's, yeah, so um, so actually, initially, I I didn't think this was would even be eligible. But then uh, when I saw some other people's lists and were on it, and then I looked at the dates, and I was like, oh yeah, it, it's just in time. Um, yeah. So I I've not read this yet, uh, but it's uh, I believe about a young woman and whose parents moved to the U.S. from Ghana, and uh, and is uh, about that past, but also about her brother who is struggling with addiction and. Um, so yeah, and I like so many other people. Absolutely loved Homegoing, and I uh, think she's an extraordinary writer. And think 
almost she's like due prize attention since weirdly homegoing didn't seem to get all that much prize attention that like it'd be really great to see this um on on the list and yeah and i'm so excited to read it basically um i have read this one. Oh, great and i loved it um i just read it last week um i i loved it it's very different from homegoing mm -hmm. um in in topic and style it is about very much about what those things the things that you mentioned but it's also and this isn't it's curious because this isn't really certainly in the uk this isn't really part of like it's not on the blurb or anything it's also massively about like faith and science um so right. the, her family is very it grows she grows up very evangelical and her mother's faith is a huge part of her life but they grow up in a very white community in alabama and the they are a black family at this church where there's not many uh, other black families and, um, and then she goes on to become a neuroscientist um, and it, the book massively is about the kind of conflict or, or what's in common, what's in conflict between faith and science and her wrestling with the sort of trauma of, of her religious childhood, but also the way that it taught her to think and how that some of that is helpful or not helpful. And as you as I mentioned obliquely sometimes and as you know Eric I grew up very religious you know sometimes you read a book and it's someone you've never met and they articulate something that is so true to what you've experienced mm. and you're just like how did you put that into the words that I have felt and I had that a lot with this book even though so many of Gifty the main characters her experiences are so different to mine the faith thing and like a lot of it is ba it's basically like when you've experienced trauma at the hands of a church how do you if you reject it how do you still pull out things that were positive from it basically like how do you make mm -hmm. peace with that experience if the things you feel you've got from it how do you make peace with those things when you've also got a lot of bad stuff from it and um it, it's I thought that's that's not like it's it's very much about all the other stuff as well but I think because obviously the stuff that chimes with you often is the stuff that you really like respond mm -hmm. to um but like stuff like she talks about like her favorite Bible verse that gave her comfort when she was a child and how she sees it now. And it was literally my favorite Bible verse when oh, I was wow. growing up. And like, you know, it just so ugh, like some of the stuff, like I was taking a lot of pictures of the pages um, and I'm not going to get too much into the personal because I think aside from that, I just think it's wonderful. It's quite like a quiet book almost like it's it's a book about like ideas. It's so absorbing despite not being like a, you know, it's not like a kind of page turner plotty reveal twisty book but it's so I found it so engrossing and absorbing I found her writing so thoughtful and precise and I loved it as you can probably tell oh, <laughs> yeah so wow. I would I loved Homegoing as well and regardless think she's due like prize attention because of how good she is but I also really just sincerely loved this book so yeah that makes me really excited even more excited to to read it now you know when you read a book and the author's just so in control of what they're doing like they you you know that they knew what they were trying to do and they, they've executed that and it hasn't mm -hmm. got away with them so i have gone for one you haven't gone for uh, which is mrs death mrs death by uh, Christina godden which i haven't read is another one kind of like uh luck and booth although maybe i should be less i <laughs> like nervous now because this is another one like on paper i feel like it's a sort of book that i will really enjoy uh because it's sort of stories about stories and again I think grappling with sort of like ideas and faith and a life lived and how you make sense of that um and a bit of kind of you know magical realism everything I know about it would make me think that I would like it basically is uh is how I feel about that one uh and I'm looking forward to reading it yeah and I have the same feeling because I haven't read it yet either but um but I literally just um ordered a copy and from a bookstore is it just so ah, it's a, it's a, it look beautiful I, although i got I have the special say, signed limited edition too oh very nice <laughs> i <laughs> don't like i don't like the title like it makes me like i don't uh, <laughs> i think I it's don't really playful like and fun. Of it. this is death <laughs> this is death like it bothers me every time i see it <laughs> And I really honestly like didn't even order it because <laughs> the title just like <laughs> bothered me. But then I read, I like Selena a lot online and I read the blurb and I was like, and then people were speaking highly of it. And I was like, I just need to get over the fact that the title, I don't like the title. <laughs> 
uh, my next choice is The Family Tree by uh, Serge Hussein, which was also on the <laughs> shortlist for the Costa Pick Awards first novel category. Um, and, uh, but yeah, this is another book that I, I thought was so uh, well done and very moving and one that I just hadn't heard many people talking about before. And um, so like, it, it was funny that like, like in, in our like, Costa Book Award discussions, like we weren't self-consciously trying to pick out books that that we felt like hadn't got much attention, but it just happened that the books that we felt really, really strongly about were these these ones. That, although you know, the, it it has got a lot of critical praise as as well. So, um, uh, but uh, but yeah, basically it um it follows story of a of a Muslim family in the UK and starts off with a heartbreaking tragedy of uh, the death of a mother um, just after the second child in their family has been born. And so basically a widowed father is left raising two children on his own and um, alongside uh, his mother and um, friends who are supporting him. And there are more tragedies amidst the story, but, but there's also just like this wonderful representation of the joy of family life, the humor found in this like loving home, um, but then also how there can be these divisions that arise when disagreements occur and especially, um, yeah, under pressured circumstances. And so uh, I, I just thought it was so well done and, um, yeah, and very moving. And, uh, and I especially appreciate it because it's looking at a like time scale in the UK of the recent past and it references like a number of major events but it's looking at them through a personal experience of a, of a Muslim experience but also the community um, this Muslim community's reaction to these larger events so it was almost making me like re-see recent British history and just like look at it from a different perspective that I just really appreciated and um so so yeah i'm really glad that it gives that that perspective as as well and i haven't read it and again i all i know about it is that you like it and you it was on the costa so uh <laughs> um also is that the one that was really long it is quite another book <laughs> that is quite long um yeah i've, I've been going for a lot of chunk stories lately and <laughs> Yeah, I think it is around like five or 600 pages again. So. Yeah. <laughs> I know that, yeah, it's just, it's don makes, it always makes it daunting from the outside of, yeah. I think with long books, I love a long book. If I'm enjoying it, it's just that it's a time commitment, isn't it? And so it's mm -hmm. more of a risk because you you want, if I, I love getting involved in long books that I'm really enjoying. So yeah, it's the risk that you're not going to like it and you're going to invest time in something. Um, Right. Is it? Yes, it's me. Yes. Next one is Luster by Raven Lilani, which... Uh, which is, yeah, my next Yes, one. I was going to say, that would be a bizarre one to not include. Um, mm. Have you read it? I have. Okay. I Great. thought this was excellent. And I must admit, again, this is one I was a bit nervous about because there was so much hype for this one, even before it had published, I think, because it had already come out in the US and been a big success there. So mm -hmm. I feel like even by the time I read it straight after it came out, it was already, I was reading it in the context of that hype. Mm -hmm. When I first started, I was a bit nervous because I was like, again, I was like, oh, it's just, it's like one of these disaster women books. And I was like, oh, it's interesting because like, often they are about kind of privileged white women. And it's definitely a different perspective because it's about a young black woman. But I felt like it was hitting a lot of the same kind of beats of those books. But then I, when it, it hits a point it, and it gets a lot more like absurd, and it's almost like becomes like Sally Rooney meets like Miranda July, like the second half of it. Like, again, mm. I, w I mean, I think we tend to go not heavily, but a little bit more spoilery with these videos. Like when she moves into the family's house, so it's about a young black woman who is having sort of an affair with an older white man. And it's like his, his wife has sort of agreed to it, but isn't like super happy about it. And then her um, sort of, life gets to the point where she gets fired and she ends up moving in with them and it takes on this like absurdist style mm. and I loved it from there on out I was so like I love that it's a bit of a different it adds this like surreal weird thing and I was just like I had no idea what was I feel like you felt like it could have gone to like some really dark places and I was sort of expecting 
that to happen. I don't want to give away too much. So I thought it was really excellent. And I liked that it added a kind of this sense of absurdity. Yeah. And it's oftentimes very funny, I, I thought. And um, yeah. and very, yeah, like very cutting sort of remarks and critiques that it's like making as well. Yeah. That's great. I, that was so good. Yeah. I also loved that um, on Twitter, Joyce Carol Oates uh, tweeted how much she uh, liked this novel too. And somebody responded uh, saying, well, I, I thought it was worthless. And, um, and Joyce Carol Oates very cattily uh, retweeted that with the comment saying, I'm sure your novel will be much better. Oh. <laughs> also, very love it. There's, uh, we should do like an Eric and Anna Women's Prize video bingo card. And because I was like, <laughs> Will we get through a video without mentioning Joyce Carol Oates? <laughs> <laughs> My next choice is The First Woman by Jennifer Natsumbuga. This was one of the last ones that I, I didn't pick it, but it was one of the like, it was one of the last ones I crossed off when I was having to narrow it down. And I, I think this has a, a strong shot. I haven't read it, but from what I know. I've not read it either. Yeah, um, though I have read her first novel, Chintu, um, which I, I really liked, although I had some issues with the, the structure, but I've heard that this is more technically accomplished and cohesive in, in her narrative. That's what I've heard as well. And like One World, it's published by One World, they have great taste yeah. and great form with prizes. So yeah, I wouldn't, this was, yes, I wouldn't be at all surprised if this, uh, and it sounds wonderful, I'd like to read it. Um, yeah, from what I understand about a, a girl growing up in Uganda and who has lots of strong female figures around her, but who slightly uh, suffocate her. And so, yeah, her finding her own identity, I think that's sort of what it's about. My next choice is No One Is Talking About This by Patricia Lockwood. Ah, okay. I am, as anyone who follows me online will know, a huge Patricia Lockwood fan girl. Um, I just think that she is remarkable and is one of my all-time favorite writers now her memoir pre-study is one of my favorite books of all time and this is her debut novel and it I just thought it was so good I like it's it's I mean it's only well it's end of February beginning of March like but I can't see how it won't be either my book of this year or right up there wow. um have you read it I have I, I can tell that face. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I just I didn't. I didn't hate it. I I sort of had mixed feelings about. Oh. It. And and basically, I really loved the first half, and then the second half, I um, it just didn't quite work for me, which was weird because I thought I would emotionally relate more to the second half, but yeah. So. So it's about a, it's about a woman. The first it's, it does feel very much like a book of two halves. It's about a woman who is like extremely online. Um, she has this tweet that kind of goes mega viral to the point where she it kind of becomes her job to be online, and she goes and speaks on panels about existing on the internet. And then and the first half of the book, well, the whole book is told in quite sort of short fragments. Um, a lot of um, I when I did an Instagram post about this, I described it as it's like again I keep mentioning Miranda July, but it's like Ali Smith meets Ma Miranda July, which it sounds like an absolutely wild thing to say because they're extremely different writers. Mm -hmm. But for me, that's like that that's where she is. She's the midpoint between these because she just manages to be like profound, whilst also like it's quite like it, you know she's got quite a dirty sense of humor. There's some <laughs> quite like crass stuff in there, which is not usually my yeah style at all but I just find her so funny they made funny. me laugh so much the first half of the book and I think as well if you're a person who does spend quite a lot of time online and is part of internet communities there's a lot of very sort of sharp funny commentary on that without being like dismissive of it I think that she's really good at understanding why it's appealing whilst also talking about the the things that are dangerous and how it affects us and then yes the second half becomes much more of a um her sister well I don't know I'm always like it's one of those ones where like trigger warnings versus spoilers and I very much are on the trigger warnings are more important I won't go into detail but basically her sister gets pregnant and the baby has like a kind of untenable disease that and they live in a state where they can't get an abortion but they know that the baby will die very quickly after it's born and so just to say about like this, the book covers abortion, it covers terminal illness and death of children with terminal illnesses. And then the second half of the book is very much her dealing with her, that situation with her family and spending time with her family and the baby and experiencing 
that with her sister it made me the second half of it made me weep like I spent the last 50 pages in full ugly crying mode we, well perhaps this one if it is long listed we can maybe yeah when we do long list and shortlist videos if it's there we can maybe get a bit we can get more into why it worked yeah, or didn't yeah. work for for both yeah. of us lots of people have been talking about it it's been really well regarded so I I wouldn't be surprised if, at all if it was on the list um, as well so. we can get into it mm. <laughs> Uh, okay, my next choice is The Art of Falling by Danielle McLaughlin. I have not read this. It's uh, her debut novel, although she's a very well regarded writer and she um, published a short story collection called Dinosaurs on Other Planets, um, which got a lot of attention. And she uh, she's won a number of awards already previously, uh, like the Wyndham Campbell Prize, which is one of the uh, wealthiest book prizes in the world. Um, so that was very lucky for her. <laughs> and uh, and um, yeah, and it's a uh, story about a woman in Ireland who, um, it's one of these funny novels that where on the surface, a lot of what's happening in the novel doesn't seem that substantial where it's a lot of it she um she has a teenage daughter um and she and her husband have just been having marital difficulties like before the start story started um it's basically shown that her husband was having an affair and she um has forgiven him for this but things are still quite tense in their relationship and most of it's like about her sort of going about her day. I think it's one of those stories that when you're reflecting on it more it starts to feel a lot more profound and there are quite a lot of plot twists in that there a figure emerges from her past um, that reveals something that she sort of was hoping was forgotten and um, and also she is organizing this art exhibit of uh, Ireland's most famous sculptor and um, but one particular sculpture uh, comes into contention when a woman emerges saying that she is the true artist of this this um this piece of art. And so, yeah, there are these like tensions in the story which um do lead to certain dramatic things happening. But mostly it's about this sort of everyday experience about her perspective and is looking at, memory and in this really interesting way and basically our understanding of history how we receive history and and think about it and i think she's just such a skillful writer and uh yeah this is a novel i hope that gets more attention right my next choice is a burning uh by megha majumda this one i haven't read it but it feels like it's one that um it was it's, it's been huge in america Mm. Uh, and I've heard really mixed things about it here but it feels like one of those books that everyone is talking about and has done very well in America yeah it's about um a group of people like a, a I think was it four or five people a small group of people three <laughs> three okay. yeah three America, friends isn't it yeah. um in contemporary India who kind of get caught up in caught up in this um attack attack on the attack on a train yeah and so I haven't read it but I uh, bought this one and because I was really interested I was intrigued to read it and I've not read it either but it's one that I almost put on my list because yeah just I feel like yeah it feels like um it's a very likely contender so we are an O so <laughs> you are <laughs> I am I am uh, but so you know that what that means <laughs> that we have Joyce Carol Oates's most recent novel Nights I can't believe start. every year you give one space to her most recent novel. I can't <laughs> like I know you're gonna do it, but every time I'm just like <laughs> so I keep living in hope that one day the woman's fries will recognize her because as everyone must know, I think she's just an absolute genius and I love all of her work and she's incredibly productive and she has a new novel every year, so she has to make the list sometime. <laughs> like it just the odds feels like it it um it should have to happen. And I'm afraid this is another big chunkster of a book. I think it's like six or seven hundred pages. She writes that thing, like she writes, she's prolific, but she also she's not writing small books. Like she churns out a huge novel every year. I don't know how she does it. Just shit. That's 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 genius. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, so yeah, I've uh, this is a, a novel about a family, um, a major 
tragedy um, occurs early on in the novel, and it's about uh, the, the grief of the family following that, mostly following the, the wife, but also their adult children, and their very different reactions to it. And um, what I think is so brilliant about this, in addition to being an incredible portrait and very moving portrait of grief um, is also really interesting about prejudice in terms of the way that um, this this tragedy occurred. Um, it occurred basically out of this um, this incident of prejudice and so shows how prejudice often comes out of this misplaced anger and how that how just that really works in terms of um, people's actions and their their mentality of, of how they're thinking. So I think it's such a fascinating example of, of like that, but also just as a portrait of family life and the complexities of family life, I, I think it's incredible. Um, so yeah, I hope more people read it and talk about it. And I hope it's on the list. Finally, Joyce Carol. Let's well, as always, I am delighted and endeared by your love of her. Uh, <laughs> and we will see if this year it happens for you. <laughs> And if it's on the list, hopefully you'll finally read a Joyce Carol Oates book. Well, I will, I mean, as always, I am uh, hoping to read the long list. I like always plan to read the whole long list, but it depends on how many yeah. books you've already read and how long they are and kind of whether you already own them and all sorts of other things. But I have intentions, as always, of, um, of reading the whole long list. I have two more M's, so we know that you don't have these. Okay. First up is The Glass Hotel by Emily uh, St. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't read this yet um, for no good reason. Like I love, like as everyone does, love Station Eleven so much. Well, I say everyone, you're doing a face like you don't, but uh... no, I did, I did. Okay, <laughs> no, I was more um, missing at the noise next door. My partner read it and loved it. He stole oh, the book as soon as it came through the door and read it and loved it, and he he thought it was excellent. And I also know that. Um, so Rachel at Again, her blog has got an Italian name, and so but Patia More Libri. She is a good friend, and uh, we again often overlap on on taste. Um, and she, I think that this is one of her favourite books of last year. Mm. And for me, that is kind of the combination of my partner and Rachel, and my general love of her. Uh, kind of makes me feel pretty confident that I. Uh, will enjoy this. You know, sometimes when you're really looking forward to a book, you almost put it off because you want to have like the perfect setting to read it in. Like you're like, I want to read it when I have a weekend that I don't have anything else to do and I can just sit and I can just enjoy yeah. it. And you don't want to just kind of pick it up and read it bitterly, but then you never just have the perfect circumstances to read. And so you never read it. And I often, I'm like, this feels like that book where I'm like, why haven't I read this yet? <laughs> but it just, it never felt like the right circumstance, but I just need to read it. Yeah, I definitely have a number of books like that. I, I, I think I, I was slightly put off because I, I heard some mixed things about it. So um, though I know, yeah, other people have absolutely loved it. What is, well, I think I know what you've got next. Oh, yeah. Um, so I've Love After Love by Ingrid Perso. Yes. Um, another book I was on the cost of book awards shortlist. But, and well, actually won the, the first novel category of the cost of book awards um, this year because uh, it's an incredible book, and I know you loved it too because it was in your favorite books that, that you read last year. And uh, yeah, a uh, story. Um, I'm sure lots of people are familiar with it now because uh, we've. Um, it's just lots of people have been talking about it. But uh, the story of a uh, family, family, well, uh, mother and son in Trinidad and their neighbor, Mr. Chaitan, and how they sort of form this uh, tight knit family together. And, uh, but then uh, there are tragic circumstances and secrets come out and uh, things go a bit haywire. And I've said this a lot before, but I can't think of another book I read last year that made me laugh and cry as much as this book did. I, I was doing both because there's so much about it that is uh, very lighthearted and uh, and funny and uh, just really touching uh, depictions of like human connections and uh, but also there are some really tragic things that happen and like again maybe like you need to give trigger warnings because there are things in it about self-harm and domestic abuse and uh, and homophobic abuse and uh, so those are all covered in the book and are taken very seriously and handled really well. Uh, but also, uh, it's just this wonderful story of human relationships and connections and the, the love and 
friendship. It's just oh, it's so good. I mean, I, yeah, loved it as well. I, everything Eric just said, I agree with. So mm. I knew we'd both have that one. My next one is Hot Stew by Fiona Mosley, oh. um, which I haven't, uh, this is another one that I wasn't sure whether to put this one and Luck and Booth on because it feels like they're both kind of, um, I think they're both playing with similar I like it's about like a community of people in a very specific geographical area and the kind of impact of things. This is set in Soho, I believe. I haven't read it, um, hasn't come out yet. I don't really know anything about Hot Stew other than the blurb sounds amazing and her debut, Elmer, was obviously very well regarded. So I want to read it and I think it sounds great. Yeah, I'm the same. I haven't read it and I don't really know anything about the, the plot um, either, but I really liked Elmet and uh, yeah, I'm so I'm looking forward to, to reading it too. Yeah, the blurb for Hot Stew because I can't remember the details, but I remember reading it and thinking this sounds wonderful. Pungent, steamy, insatiable Soho, the only part of London that truly never sleeps. Tourists dawdling, chances skulking, addicts shuffling, sex workers strutting, punters prowling, businessmen striding the homeless in the lost down Wardour Street, ducking onto Dean Street, sweeping into Lescargo, darting down quiet back alleyways, skirting dumpsters and drunks emerging onto the raucous main roads busy with energy and rise to the life on a corner sits a large townhouse the same as all its neighbors but this building hosts a teeming throng of rich and poor full from the basement right up to the roof terrace and then there's more detail about the people but this is why it made me think of luck and luck and booth because it's that right. like one house mm. lots of stories in a very specific like the place is important um mm. but i think also like i am a londoner i love soho i think especially at the moment like I can't go anywhere. I miss like when I just just even reading that, it makes my heart hurt, and it's not mm -hmm. even particularly exciting or glamorous description of it. So reading that, I was like, that's why I put this on there because I think that sounds marvelous. Okay, I am on to uh, someone you possibly didn't put on because you mentioned that you're not a fan. Um, uh, Marilyn Robinson um, for her most recent novel, Jack, which I've not read, uh, but I really want to read, and uh, though I feel. Uh, slightly uncertain about it. I, I don't know too much about the details of it, except that it's um, the fourth book in this set. Uh, she's been writing about a particular family, and this is about the son of the family uh, who has been sort of estranged and comes back home. And uh, But I have very mixed feelings in a way about Marilyn Robinson as well. Like I think she she is a genius, um, but I when I read Gilead, I had a very cold reaction to it. It just didn't really affect me very much. But when I read her novel, Lila, I thought that was brilliant and I loved it so much. And I've not read the second book in the series. So, um, so I feel like I'm all over. I, I had this like grand plan, you know, we make these like grand reading plans sometimes where like, I'll go back and I'll reread Gilead, then I'll read Home, the second book, then I'll reread Lila and then I'll read Jack. And mm -hmm. I just haven't got around to doing that yet. So well, they are quite dense. I've uh, So I've only read Home. Uh, and it didn't make me want oh, okay. I, I mean, like, huh. I found it on a sentence level hugely impressive. Like, craft wise, I mm -hmm. thought like she's an it's it's she's an incredible writer. But I just um, I found it overwhelmingly bleak to read home. Mm. I found I got very angry about is this poor woman the door one of the daughters who's got has to go home and it's basically I think I did the women's prize podcast actually when we talked about this book and that's why I read it and um I think I said like it's about one woman's life basically being ruined by the disappointing men around her it's almost like I didn't feel like it wasn't almost a treat they are treated as disappointing but like not enough like for me they were like villainous almost and even Jack like who's more of a hero like he just he's selfish and he ruins her life he mm. really got to me it made me feel miserable also as we have touched on it's very much about faith and yeah. I have a complicated relationship with faith it's not for me her her take whilst being impressed and understanding her skill as a writer the stories she are is telling are not ones I'm interested in like engaging with really. Well it's interesting because I wonder what you would make of Lila then since that wasn't the sense I got at all from. I popped up as a character in Home and she was by far the most interesting character. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I should read maybe I should read Lila maybe that's the one um but I don't think I can hack Jack because it's about Jack um mm. and again this is 
we maybe we both should maybe we should both read all four and do a deep dive into <laughs> an interesting that. project yeah although actually do you know what i don't really want to i don't want to give that much time of my life to like, or maybe I you should just read housekeeping the novel that's not at all to do with this series at all yeah. which I, I i thought it was brilliant too okay okay i like honestly like it's the again i you bring your own stuff to books i'm really sensitive to how stuff to do with faith is portrayed and would tend to react like transcendent kingdom or home i tend to react strongly one way or the other and i think that it's not necessarily okay i absolutely recognize that's not an objective reaction but it is still it's books that's we react subjectively and so I just have kind of made peace with the fact that Marilyn Robinson is just not like not a, not a writer for me. Yes, so I picked The Liars Dictionary by Ellie Williams. Uh, Did you? You you? So I have to look through. Yes, there you are. <laughs> but I, I have a couple before that. So yeah. oh, we've skipped. We've like <laughs> I've jumped. Well, actually, yeah, I have jumped straight from M to W with nothing in between. I loved this book. It was one of my absolute favourites from last year. It is a book that felt like, honestly, it's one of those books that I felt like was written for me. It ticks so many <laughs> of my boxes of things that I like. Like it's historical fiction. It's kind of got a meta narrative to it. It's about words and wordplay. It's got a dual narrative. Um, it's got like like a sense of kind of, abs it's real, it's real, but it's got a sort of sense of absurdity to it. It's just so extremely Very funny. taste in in books um and i loved it and i would absolutely love to see it long listed the scene with the bird i thought is so <laughs> hilarious and weird and like and yeah uh, <laughs> so good it's a book so it's a book it's a dual narrative set partly in um now and partly in the past when this dictionary is being compiled the past narrative is about a man who is compiling the dictionary um and starts throwing it oh i can't remember the word of the what what's it weasel called? something mount weasels which mm -hmm. means fake definitions basic fake words and definitions so he starts throwing those in and then we have a narrative in modern times where a, the dictionary is kind of this like embarrassment of a dictionary because it's never finished that's is that what it is it's never finished yeah and also they're um they're still producing this physical dictionary where like everything is online now and so yeah, it's, and it's just like a relic abundant. and it's the owner is like the family, the descendant of the family who put it together. And this one woman who's been hired basically to weed out, like, well, to digitize and then to weed out these mount weasels. And so she discovers these words that this man has put in and you hear about where they've come from, but also it's her experiences. And I just loved it. <laughs> it's it's, um, I know it's like a very obvious comparison, but, but people compare it to Ali Smith quite a lot because of the amount of wordplay in it. And also the, I think sort of like, hearted and humorous take that that she she brings to to her stories yeah. and that's a very apt i would say the last picture is a bit more um kind of straightforward narrative i would say just in yeah. terms of like if you it's sacrilegious to even suggest that people don't like ali smith but if you find her too kind of fragmentary and um there's not enough plot mm then that this has a proper kind of linear quite linear narrative with plot and twists and reveals but it also has this kind of meta framing device i think it's another novel that just so many people will really enjoy yeah. reading it's like it's a joy to to read and uh and also yeah i think it's so clever how she it basically alternates between the past and the present day and how she brings those two narratives together um i always really appreciate when an author can have this sort of dual narrative but then have them come together in a really meaningful way uh, like another novel that i will be talking about soon uh Ooh. so it's my next one which is uh the mermaid of fat conch by monique rafi which was the overall winner of the costa book awards this year um for it, it was it won the novel category um just the main novel category and then it won the the overall prize this year i felt like when it came out not a huge amount of people were talking about it. I, I was talking about it like mid-year is one of my favorite books that I'd read so far in the year and was really enthusiastic about it, but I didn't hear all that many other people talking about it. But recently it's been a lot more award attention. She was previously long listed for the Women's Prize for Fiction. So I feel like it's, it's likely in that sense as well. And also she's just one of these authors that I feel like has been producing a lot of really interesting books over the years and it's sort of like her time to start 
getting more attention like this. And also it's just yeah, really wonderful story set on a um, fictional Caribbean island where a uh, mermaid is uh, basically caught by some American fishermen tourists and uh, but is then rescued by a fisherman on the island who they basically have a, a love affair with each other. So it's about this sort of like mythology, but also about really cleverly about the history of colonialism in the Caribbean. And uh, and so it's a really entertaining story, but also a really meaningful one. And I just think it's a wonderful novel. I think this is one that you will have, uh, which is We Are All Birds of Uganda. Uh, yes. Uh, mm. By Hassa Zayan, which I haven't read yet. <laughs> um, honestly, I've mainly put this on because you like it. <laughs> um, I, this, okay, this is a book, this uh, that it's um it's murky books it won the murky books a sort of search for a, a, a new writer you award yeah it's one that just does not appeal to me um oh. as like the as in the blurb doesn't appeal to me but mm -hmm. the, people keep telling me it's good and uh you loved it and everyone just seems to think like so I feel like it's and and I feel like it's got a really strong chance and I think I obviously you know sometimes do you remember last year like was it last year or the year before I was just like I don't want to read Milkman <laughs> and yeah I, like, convinced myself that I wouldn't like it and then it was possibly my favorite book on the whole long list that was two years ago mm -hmm. wasn't it I think I need something to make me read it because I'm being irrational about it so it's a a uh, story um, set in Uganda in the 1960s, where you get a second person narrative of a man writing letters to his deceased wife, uh, talking about his his life, but also it's about present day uh, London and a man who's a lawyer who um, might be soon taking a very big career step. But it's another example, um, this is what I was talking about before about like dual narrative that uh, like comes together so well. The, the way she brings those two stories together uh, is, is I think so moving and so impactful, both in what it's saying about the overall message of, of the novel and the, the themes it's, it's talking about, but also just story-wise, it's like, I find it so exciting and moving. And uh, and so yeah, how it does that I think is um, is is incredible and and says so much about like national identity and our conceptions of national identity. I think it's got a good shot. How many cards do you have left? I only have one left now. I have one too. I kind of can't believe you didn't put this on, but uh... oh, I'm like, oh my goodness, what if I? Well, that's because well, I don't know whether she. Yeah. Is... I know that she doesn't submit she's not submitting for Booker anymore but I didn't know if it was a prizes thing yeah also it's... summer was my least favorite of the quartet oh hmm oh that's interesting so, <laughs> um, <laughs> and so the combination of <laughs> I'm pretty sure Ali doesn't watch YouTube so um <laughs> <it's fine. laughs> I mean I did I thought it was wonderful it's just compared to the other four, hmm. which have all been like one of my favorite books I've read each year. Summer just wasn't, was, it was just, you know, I thought it was excellent, but of the four, it was my least favorite. That's really yeah. interesting. Cause I would think of the four, probably spring is my least favorite. So yeah. Hmm. I mean, that is a video that we should do because we've read mm -hmm. all four and we love Ali and you know, I yeah. happily don't spend time rereading these books and talking about that. Maybe it's for slightly like sentimental reasons and because yeah. it's, the, it's the last book in the quarter, I feel like it should like go on to win every major award, even though, like you said, I, I'm pretty sure like she doesn't want her books to be submitted or at least definitely didn't want it to be submitted to the booker anymore. Partly the reason why I love reading it so much was because it was the coming together of all these characters I've been reading over the years and then, you know, it was making me re reflect about the crazy events over the past four yeah. years and it's sort of like everything coming together and I know I guess I read it in the summer when, you know, it was the, the height of craziness of, of like lockdown and stuff and so was it, this was all like hitting me quite hard and so that she was actually writing about this while it was like happening was felt made it feel all the more impactful and but but I think like outside of that too like some of the themes and the way she's like 
representing this this um this this boy who's basically like a proto fascist and some of his like beliefs and ideas and and to to try to get into that mindset at this time i think is really meaningful as well and um so yeah i think i loved it <laughs> yeah and obviously like i would be delighted to see her longest and shortest to win anything for anything um and some of you know special like eric and i and our friend uli from gaze the word we had a lovely little when we were allowed it was all uh, yeah. allowed, we had a lovely little picnic outside to celebrate summer coming out and it was one of the only sort Got of dressed up <laughs> we all well i we were supposed to do the seasons <laughs> where you went all in i was spring mm -hmm. and i actually i maybe even wore this dress but i had like a flower headband on it you know yeah. Um, but uh, Eric fully just painted its face. <laughs> like, like, I represented winter. <laughs> so we were sat in a park in the summer, and Eric was just had his face painted white with his beard grey, and then it all melts it off quite quickly. <laughs> that was a very it was a very fun memory as well, just because you know I did we did so many like so few social things last year, and mm. that was a really really lovely evening and I adore Ali I slightly with Summer have the like I was like oh I can't remember I was like I know that I know that character like and I couldn't quite remember the mm. particulars of where we'd met them that's almost sometimes more and frustrating as a reader mm. than when you just can't you just think it's a new character I kept reading characters as I was like oh I know that character and I couldn't quite remember which and I was getting characters from the previous books mixed up and I think it kept taking me out of it because I kept trying to like Mm -hmm. work out who was who so I think I would benefit from reading them straight through well, and we I should definitely do that and make that video when the omnibus or whatever yes. like group let's, edition of all four books being published together that would be a great thing to let's do. do that well maybe see if we can convince Uli to be on camera yeah so my last choice is the one I haven't read uh and it is how much of these hills is gold by C. Pam Zhang um which is one that did you was it you did you not like it because I feel like it was one I've not but, read it actually uh, someone someone yeah. I trust didn't like it mm. and I feel like it put me off but then when I was do and I kind of disregarded it because sometimes as well when you have so many books to read it really is the smallest thing that makes you disregard a book because it's just a way of deciding what to read yeah and so I kind of put it to one side thinking it wasn't my cup of tea maybe it was maybe it was Rachel um and then when I was doing this list and looking at what was coming up I read some more I read the blurb and I I thought that it sounded wonderful and it's been very well reviewed and it's had you know it's on the book a long list so I feel like it's kind of going to be one of those ones that's kind of in contention yeah but it's not very, um, too. I wish we'd finished with summer because I feel like this last like last one I'm like I haven't read it but like it's <laughs> been on the other awards and it sounds good so that's why I included it and I don't have anything more profound to say about yeah, it yeah and I can't I don't have much more to say but it's <laughs> one that I've been meaning to read as well but that, yeah, yeah just um haven't got to for for whatever reason so we're done so we have yeah. seven in common we have oh, yeah. sugar the vanishing half transcendent kingdom luster love after love and the liars, no, the liars dictionary, and we are all birds of Uganda. Yeah, it's quite a lot of crossover. Nearly half. Mm. Which is, um, yeah, considering I had like 30 something books that I was yeah, strongly considering putting on the list. I think that's but I reckon a lot of our nearly included will have matched up as well. And I think as well, a lot of the ones that we were mentioning were uh ones that were familiar to each other there was definitely a couple of yours that I had really nearly put on I think there was one of mine one or two of mine that you yeah, had nearly put on so it'd be really interesting and I do think from looking at other people's predictions it does feel like there's less kind of wild card picks like less random ones there mm. seems to be a lot of books that are cropping up on everybody's predictions list and it'll be really interesting to see if we're all in sync with the judges or they go yeah, it might go completely wild. <laughs> yeah, and there's things like, like I didn't know whether to include the Sarah Moss, but she's never like this, yeah. just, you know, because you sort of think, well, do you know, will her publisher keep submitting? Because Picador is such an interesting publisher because publishers can submit two books per imprint, plus as free pass for anyone who's been shortlisted before. But Picador has such a strong list and a list that mm. always really overlaps, I think, with women's prizey books. Mm -hmm. But like they had Luster is theirs, 
Sarah Moss is theirs, Emily St. John Mandel is theirs, um, Emma Donahue is theirs, which I thought was a contender as well, Elizabeth McNeil is theirs, although she's not actually, I don't think she's eligible this year. Um, there's another one as well that I was, oh, The, the Lamplighters by Emma Stonex, which is a, oh, yeah. one of their big debuts, I thought might be an option, and yeah, so there's a level of like, which two, they can only pick two, none of the people have been shortlisted, people have been longlisted, but none of them have been shortlisted before, mm. so it's fast. I'd love to be a fly on the wall in the <laughs> publisher meetings where they have to decide which books are being submitted when there's these very strict rules and only a few books. And um, so it'd be really interesting to see uh, what pops up. And there's always books that I've never heard of. And, you know, particularly it's good because, you know, the small presses will be submitting books. And often there are a couple from small presses that I haven't come across before that are really wonderful. Uh, and no doubt some that I disagree vehemently with, but that's part of the fun. Yeah, make it interesting discussions. <laughs> yeah, it'll be exciting to see on March 10th, but uh, like we said, uh, let, let us know in the comments uh, what you think of our choices, or if you have alternative choices that you'll really be rooting for and hoping to see on the long list. It'd be so great to see everyone's discussion and thoughts about yeah all of this, because it's just fun to speculate. So. It is. I'm excited to see what's there I really it is a fun bit of the year women's prize season and especially this year with that, uh, that hope that we might be able to celebrate Do you know the last last year the last book party I went to was the women's prize long list party yeah me too I think yeah that's and everyone was it was starting to be like a thing and people were like no one was kissing each other's cheeks and everyone was a bit like we had an email just before saying if you've been like to some of these countries please don't come like mm. if you feel sick please don't come and then also that's the party where we were stood watching the presentation and then I was like Eric Eric Stanley Tucci's to do it next to you <laughs> and, <laughs> and I, like, like, I couldn't hear it and I was just like what who's there what and she's like Stanley Tucci is there <laughs> and he was um he's all off I mean he's often at women's prize parties because his wife is on the board um but always a fun uh fun like I spy at uh, women's prize events it's Stanley Tucci here and who's his new film uh Supernova uh which still hasn't come out yet because cinemas have been closed it's such a good film it's oh, so brilliant and uh yeah last time Anna came over she actually watched the trailer of it because uh my partner works for the uh distribution company that is releasing it so that's good I felt very in the notes fun. I watched the trailer before it had been released and I got, got was quizzed on what I thought about something. So uh, <laughs> like a, I'm like a film influencer now, basically. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, what, what a joyous Friday. occasion on July 7th it'll be if we do get to be in a physical party. I feel like we'll like probably be instantly drunk and like making fools yes, of us. I'll probably wear a ball gown and get drunk immediately. <laughs> 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 it's what's needed it's what we, need. be so uh, we can only hope uh, but regardless of whether we are doing these things in person or virtually we will of course be keeping doing our usual uh videos so we will we don't normally do a long list re reaction do but we'll do a short list mm. prediction and yeah. i think probably a short list reaction as well mm. uh, and a winner's prediction yeah and i was wondering maybe if um if since we've gotten more used to these uh, video calls and and since we probably still won't be able to physically meet at that point, maybe we should do like a live one, a live reaction where we can get people's comments uh, as we're okay. like discussing them and like, yeah, that would be really Let's, fun. That's a good idea. Cause we sort of, we did a live, we live streamed our reaction to the shortlist last year on my YouTube channel. Oh yeah. Um, but I, um, we, so we should definitely like, we should definitely try and do, it'd be fun to kind of, push that more in advance so people can come and join in as and, and react with us yeah so let us know in the comments if you would yeah. like to have that as well and would, would uh, be keen to participate in, yeah because the last one was more of a necessity i feel like we kind of did it like that just because we mm -hmm. it was the first time we had to work out how to do it digitally <laughs> but we could do it more consciously and on purpose this time yeah and be a bit more organized and yeah setting a date and trying to get everyone to to join yeah. in oh that'll be fun let's do that <laughs> yeah that'd be good great great oh. There we go. So uh, yeah, very exciting season ahead. Um, so yeah, thanks so much, Anna. Thanks for discussing it with me. Thank you. Thanks everyone for watching. And I'm really looking like, do let us know what you think. I'm excited to keep chatting with Eric and all of you about uh, this year's prize. I have high hopes for a good year. I do too. Yeah, I think, yeah, by all this, yeah, list of authors, yeah, it has to be a good group this year. So.
looking forward to it. Okay. Uh, speak to you again soon, everyone. Bye.